Something I always look for in an anime, especially a long-running shonen-esque series where our characters are developing and there happens to be action slash fantasy, is a good power system. I feel like a power system can make or break a world and has the potential to bring the entire series to life purely based on the ins and outs of what makes the fights great. Now, I'll have you know right off the bat, it's not per se an exciting fight scene that draws me into the series, but if the fight scene is crafted well in regards to how the power system attaches itself to other, far more deep parts of the series thematically, that is when I fall in love with anime fights. Now, I've made several videos on power systems, highlighting what makes individual ones great, like Black Clover or One Punch Man, and one of my favorite power systems ever, that I've only realized was one of my favorite power systems ever is actually Pokemon's. Pokemon Battles is a legitimate power system that I have completely overlooked until this point. When it came to the realization that, oh my god, this is actually amazing! I knew I had to make a video on it just purely due to the fact that it's overlooked so much since it's a so-called childhood series. Now, before even getting into the mechanics, one thing that I cannot stress enough how much I love is the fact that everyone is born equal. Everyone has 100% rights to acquire ultimate power due to their mind, wit, and perseverance. Granted, luck is always involved, just like it is in real life, but no one is selected to be above one another by the universe itself. Now, this is almost unique as far as power systems go. Whether you're born with more chakra or an affinity to a certain magic or an individual superpower, or even in sports anime, where the power system is the sport they're playing, certain players are born with different physique, whether they're taller or shorter, springier or bouncier. Yes, everything exists in sports anime. Or in something like Shokugeki no Soma, a cooking show where the power system is freaking cooking. Different people have different natural talents, like the ultimate nose or the god tongue. Very seldom is there a power system that is a complete baseline for everyone in the world, where anyone could grow Grab the world by the balls and make something of themselves. This is the bare bones foundation of the Pokemon power system. And honestly, it is inspiring. If it's a scenario where literally anyone can claw their way to the top, every victory is not only deserved, but completely justified. It negates the element of fate that is so prevalent in the mere birth of most other characters in most other power systems. In Pokemon, anyone can become anything. It's a philosophy that likes to be spread throughout many different forms of media. You have My Hero Academia where the main character was born with no quirk, but he tried so hard. He was basically given the strongest quirk ever by Superman Jesus, and now he's freaking awesome. So it wasn't exactly his willpower, refusal to give up, and heart of justice that made him strong. No, it was fate. Naruto was an underdog protagonist, and through hard work he managed to get somewhere, but in the end of the day that somewhere involved the nine-tailed fox demon spirit inside him causing every single one of his victories in the entire series. It's a beautiful ideal and philosophy to push forward that anyone can become anything but in the realm of most power systems as beautiful as it is it's just not true. This ideal holds so true in Pokemon and that's the foundation for literally everything that is to come. One of the main themes of Pokemon is chasing your dreams, and that's a popular theme throughout many different series. However, Pokemon is the only one where chasing your dream, at least in regards to the power system, is 100% possible. And that's what I mean by what I said in the beginning. The power system matters in regards to the fights themselves, but it matters so much more in regards to how it blossoms the world around them, the themes of the series, as well as the different ideologies of characters. And speaking of, that is the next point I would like to bring up. Every character has the potential to have a different ideology than one another. This is seen far better in the Pokemon Adventures manga than in the anime where people are just basically playing a game and therefore you can see the differences in ideology so much stronger there. Not that it doesn't exist in the anime, but it's not nearly as beautifully written. In the anime, for example, my favorite case of this is Ash's rival in Diamond and Pearl, Paul. Paul has a very different ideology in regards to Pokemon battles than Ash, and it's not that his tactic doesn't work. 
his team is freaking awesome. But in the end of the day, you have to realize the battle system is not 100% mechanical and it's not something purely within yourself. This power system, by definition, involves dealing with other life forms and therefore relationships are formed and it's automatically unpredictable. Paul drives them to the max. He tries to draw 100% out of every single one of his Pokemon, but when Ash doesn't train them to 100% of their potential, only to 80% because he doesn't push them that hard, the adrenaline boost and willpower that the individual Pokemon have to win for their friend and trainer pushes their limits to 120% in dire situations. Obviously, I made up these numbers, but you get what I'm saying. Everyone has a different style of battle, and even though the base world is exactly the same for anyone, and everyone can potentially traverse the same path, everyone, based on their own personal values, will shape their entire team, as well as how their team works completely differently. One potential flaw someone can come up with for a battle system where the baseline is exactly equal, and everyone can reach the same point through taking the same actions, is redundancy. And the Pokemon battle system eliminates this form form of redundancy because the Pokemon that are the battle system are alive on their own right. No two relationships are the same, and this battle system, in essence, is a relationship. There was one chapter in the Pokemon Adventures manga where Red, someone who's far more idealistically driven and bond-driven than Blue, accidentally swapped his Pokemon with Blue's. Now, Blue, who is nowhere near Paul in the level of assholery and is an absolutely dope character with a bond to their Pokemon, definitely focused on a far more regimented growth than Red's freer approach. Now, switching Pokemon, they each had an incredibly hard time dealing with the different situations that would befall them. Blue was so harsh to these warm and cuddly red Pokemon, and Red was all lovey-dovey to Blue's regimented Pokemon. Eventually, they each learned from the other trainer, and both trainers learned of their own flaws through seeing what each other's Pokemon had that they themselves didn't, and both trainers grew because of it. When Red fought Blue in the championship final of the Indigo League, they each changed their battle style so much since that point, it was clear that they learned from each other. It was clear that despite their natural tendencies, they swallowed their pride and changed up their style in order to grow. Now, not only is that another life lesson, you know, swallowing your pride to learn from someone else, and in essence, it's crucial to understand because you realize Pokemon battles is their lives at this point. Red and Blue are two of the strongest trainers in the world, and to admit your own flaws and absorb your rival's ideologies, and vice versa, it goes to show just what level people Red and Blue are as well. The reason why why Ash will never be a Red is purely for this reason. Ash's ideology is unwavering, whereas Red is constantly seeking personal growth alongside his Pokemon. Now that we've talked about how it fits with the philosophy of the world and the idea of following your dreams, and it also matters depending on the individual ideology of the trainer, which path they will take in training their Pokemon, now, after all said and done, we can begin to talk about the mechanics of Pokemon battles and why this is truly such an amazing power system by its own right that can hold everything that I've mentioned on its shoulders. And here is where I have to make a big distinction between the anime and manga. In the Pokemon anime, Pokemon battles is a sport. A fun one, it's fun to watch, there's strategies and all that, and it's not that watching sports or sports anime is bad, but it is nothing more than that. In the Pokemon manga, Pokemon battles are stand battles from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. You're fighting to win, you're fighting to kill. Your life is on the line, and that's when real thinking out of the box begins. To use a form of metaphor to contrast the two, watching a Pokemon battle in the anime is watching a trainer play Smash Bros where the Smash characters are Pokemon. You're essentially watching a Let's Play. It's not a perfect analogy because obviously there's bonds with the Pokemon, they're not completely mechanical, but to contrast it with the Adventures manga, watching Pokemon Adventures is like watching a chess game. Not watching someone play a chess game because the trainer is the king. Yes, he can only move one square left and right. He is the weakest piece on the board, but when you take the enemy trainer, that is how you win. But it's more than that. It's more than just chess. Chess has an infinite amount of moves from the pieces you have. But in Pokemon, even though you're starting at the same baseline, the way you train your Pokemon gives you a different party to your opponent. You have slightly different pieces than he does. And not only that, 
that, but there are far more variables involved in literally every fight. Whether the trainer is riding their Pokemon, or whether they made their Pokemon like Bruno did with his Onyx, the actual battlefield they were standing on before the fight even started, so that when the fight begins, he can shake things up, trying to annihilate the enemy trainer, while he worked out his body so much, he can stand on this Onyx and he knows the movements. He's comfortable on this terrain, and things work out so much better for him when he has stable footing and his opponent does not. Not only that, but he has nunchucks with Pokeballs at the edge of the nunchucks, so he could send out his Pokemon at so much closer range to his opponent, closing the distance between them so much faster, so his Pokemon can hopefully take out the enemy trainer before the enemy trainer's Pokemon even has the chance to block. He can attack past the enemy's defenses, and this is how he's trained himself to win Pokemon battles. With the six Pokemon anyone has in their possession, they can use any harebrained scheme they want to win, and that's why Pokemon battles is most similar as far as power systems to JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. There, it's all strategy. Every stand has a very unique power, and everyone has to try to figure out the other one's power and get past it. Pokemon has a very different style, because once you see the enemy Pokemon, if you're well-researched, you will understand it, because the way someone becomes a powerful Pokemon trainer is traveling through the land. It's understanding the Pokemon that inhabit their region, and where the surprises in battle don't come from the Pokemon themselves as much as they come from the opposing trainer, while in JoJo's, all the surprises come from the enemy's stand. Also, just to be clear, stand powers are given to different stand users at random, whereas Pokemon get a baseline, where you have to amass your own team, form your own bonds with other living creatures, and create your own strategies and way to fight. As a simple example of this, at the most basic level, when Red fought Giovanni, you know, for the Earth Badge, not when it was Mewtwo versus Deoxys, but I'm getting ahead of myself. You should all read the Pokemon Adventures manga if I didn't make that clear yet. Giovanni calculated exactly what Red could do. He understood Red still had a Pikachu in its Pokeball. He calculated the amount of time it would take for Red to send out Pikachu, Pikachu to charge its electric attack, and to discharge its electric attack. And based on those amount of seconds, he knew he had the time to defeat Red. Red, however, has a silent bond with Pikachu, and as Pikachu begin charging its electric attack inside the Pokeball, that doesn't hurt Red because Red has electric proof gloves that he previously stole from Team Rocket when Lieutenant Zurge captured Zapdos and had a cannon firing exploding electrodes, but I get ahead of myself again. And because Pikachu charged its attack inside the Pokeball, Red saved two critical seconds and won the fight. That's a victory based purely on ideology. Giovanni is a far superior Pokemon trainer, and when Giovanni fought Lance, he made that very, very clear. But that doesn't matter. Red's ideology and his ideal of trust is what, in eventuality, caused his victory against Giovanni this time. It's a power system with so many moving parts that relies on so many different important themes in regards to the world, in regards to the character, in regards to the overall Pokemon philosophy, and in regards to us viewers. We learn more about the Pokemon, we learn more about the world, and the more we do, the more we want to be part of the world, part of the philosophy of chasing your dreams, and part of Red's ideology of trust and care. The Pokemon that we're all used to is the Pokemon in the anime that we've grown up with, and I understand why one would not per se jump for joy at the thought of this power system being analyzed. I mean, even if you have a six on six battle, you're sending out one Pokemon at a time, where type advantages matter so damn much. But everything gets flipped on its head when it's a free for all to win. When Blaine uses Mewtwo's psychic to break the mechanism in Lance's Pokeball so he can't send out his dragons, but Lance foreseeing something like this happening already sent out his dragons that were lying in wait to ambush his opponents. Where Green had Ditto form a fake arm so that when Lorelei would freeze her arm with an ice shackle, she'd be able to easily wiggle free because it's just a Ditto and she can continue fighting. Whether it's Koga using his Golbat's supersonic to pick up everything in the vicinity despite it being pure black and use those supersonics to form some form of static picture in Golbat's mouth, giving Koga a little television screen of what's going on even though no one else can see because they're all blinded. Whether it's Giovanni getting completely annihilated by Lance because Lance is just that much stronger. I made a whole video on the Elite Four, mostly Lance. Link in the description and at the end. I am very proud of that video actually. For the first time, analyzing why the Elite Four is so incredible. But Giovanni won that fight. He rolled his Beedrill's Pokeball past Lance while Lance was annihilating him and Beedrill attacked 
attacked him from behind. Red used the force of Blue's Machamp's vital throw to give Snorlax an aerodynamic body slam that gave Machamp one of the greatest reaction faces of all time, knowing the end was near. But like nature, there are also genetic defects you have to look into as well. Certain Pokemon have abilities past what most Pokemon of their species do. For example, Koga's Arbok can regenerate, and Agatha's Arbok can go into different forms depending on the pattern on its hood, whether it's extra speed, extra defense, or whatever. Bruno's Hitmanlee can extend its arms the same way as its legs, and Red's Eevee, which he saved from one of Team Rocket's labs, can change freely from Vaporeon to Jolteon to Flareon. There are anomalies in this world as well that also have to be looked into because this is a real world, and Pokemon are not the mechanics of a game, and they're also not mindless zombies following your every command. I'm always a bigger fan of a power system that has more to do with strategy than brute force. And in the Pokemon Adventures manga, that is definitely the case. On a technical level, the Pokemon battle system is everything I want in a battle system. Thematically, it fits with the ideals of the series, and it changes depending on the ideals of the individual characters that harness Pokemon to fight by their side. This world takes out societal norms and people that are born above others in different classes than others. There's no idea of nobility that goes alongside power. In Naruto, usually the son of the previous Kage is really strong. In Black Clover, if you're a noble, then you have more magic. In My Hero Academia, depends which quirk you were born with, and either people will look up to you if you're a Bakugo, or you'll be like the dude in Bakugo's friend fan club thingy with the long, wishy eyeballs, which probably does not get him a huge amount of fans. Aside from leveling your Pokemon up to dummy thick levels of magnitude, which obviously increases their strength, there's also the idea of honing your own skills, honing your own strategies, and coming up with new ways to attack individual problems. In order to do this, you have to understand the individual Pokemon better. You have to understand the Pokemon species better and the world and battle conditions better. The Pokemon battle system is a microcosm of literally everything amazing about Pokemon. And that is why it's one of my favorite power systems of all time. That's why it's an underappreciated gem. And that's why you should subscribe to this channel for more epic Pokemon videos that you didn't even know you wanted, as well as anime videos and analysis and satire. And I do everything. And I apologize for my voice. I do have a cold. I'll try to survive. Never fear. Link in the description to my Twitter. Feel free to follow me there, as well as to my Patreon. All patrons are invited to the Discord server. And I especially wanted to thank David and Ol, Negus Nogus, Burning Bush, Rise Warren, Sage of Snake, Wilson Fletcher, Team Sparky 65, Lazy Ronin, Girthy Worm, Jin, Chunky Niblet, Allison Stricker, The Wolf of Gar, JD Fincher, E Laser, Shin, The Ethan, Ravy Landek, Kevin McLean, Jordan, White Noise 32, Talon, Best is Daddy Cross, Mitchell Garnet, Miriam Ramirez, Chesie, Tregreen, Ham is the Great, Ian Martin, Praise Lord of the Girigameshu, Billy Thompson, Serial Flex Offender, Sinon, Lord Sasho Maru, Kid Ori, JJ Slabrams, Joshua Faber, The Knight Brights, LJ, Kaiser Wanar, Don Soko, Nothing But a Fan, Divine Reigns, Hexiled, Tea Kui, Skyler Leg, Some Guy Named Bob, Samuel Guzman, Burling Halo, Los Polos Hermanos, Juan Centano, Karma, King Rainbow, Jeffrey Baltasar, and Camelane. Thanks to the Lord Tweeger rank, Steelers, Chubbs is the Man, Noctris 13, Pod 6 was Jerks, Elliot Gonzalez, MD, Adria Pika, Sosa Nerdified, Everest, the Ninth Master, and Typical Anime. Thanks to the God Usopp rank, Dark Element, Eduardo Flores, Poozerker, Steve, Muafak, Necro, Sunny Parks, Maurice Luis Dreyfus, and Esposito. Thank you to Datura Metel and Gintama for Life for having Hashirama cells. And thanks, Steve, for being the man, the myth, the legend. Very cool. Hope you enjoyed this video. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it. I always like making these power system videos because power systems are amazing. Have yourselves the most wonderful evening and remember to stay weird, fam. <laughs>